Steam locomotives in miniature at the Steam Workshop, part 21. Tank tops and handrails. And the first part of the job is to refit the tank tops, but before doing that, I'm using an 8BA tap to just make sure that none of these holes are blocked up with paint. This part of the rebuild seemed quite simple. And indeed it is relative to some of the other jobs, but I did have to cut down the 8BA bolts to fit them underneath the handrails and get them into the holes. I'm also having to use a screwdriver with a very thin point so that it comfortably fits in the slot. I'm also using the screwdriver on a full length bolt here and this is a bit wrong, so I'll put that right and use a different screwdriver to tighten the rest of these bolts which has a slightly broader blade. And the debate goes on. Are these classified as bolts or are they classified as screws? Who knows, it's just one of life's mysteries. I would refer to these as bolts because they have a bolt type thread. Whereas to me, screws are two things. They're either wood screws with a sharp pointy thread that's very coarse and bites into wood, or the self-tapping screws with a sharp pointy thread that bites into metal. And there is of course a third variant on the word screw, no four really when I think about it. There's the obvious one and also the slang name for a prison officer. Anyway, back to the job. I'm fitting the last bolt in place. And now it's time to fit these two pieces of brass angle that I cleaned up and painted last week. These hold the handrails in place, but it's a very strange design. These bolt down to the running boards, but they don't support the handrail until the side is fully bolted to the back, which in turn is bolted down to the running board. When I built a 7 quarter inch gauge Titch locomotive many years ago, which I still have, I used what I think is a much simpler method for mounting handrails. First of all, I drilled some shallow holes and not all the way through the brass half round beading that are then silver soldered around the window openings at each side of the cab. Then I drilled a corresponding hole in the running boards and again not all the way through, just a shallow hole. Then the handrails didn't need machining at all and they just trapped between the half round beading and the running boards and they've never fallen out. Anyway, back to this one. This one works differently so I'm following the same procedure. I'm using a couple of 4BA brass bolts to fasten the brass angle to the running board. And there's not much to mention about this, it's a very simple operation. First of all, I fitted the nut onto the thread using the small socket full of tissue paper, and then I used a box spanner to tighten it all the way. And I've paused the video to show the modification to the box spanner that I did many years ago. It just allows for a bit more clearance in small spaces. In this clip I'm fitting three 6BA bolts down each side of the roof. This is to hold the roof and the spectacle plate in position, because the spectacle plate never got separated from the roof. And now for the back part. This back panel is held to the engine with two 4BA bolts that go down into the running boards, and then it had four 8BA countersunk bolts to hold the cab side to the back panel. The problem was that a couple of these very small 8BA bolts had stripped the threads in the piece of brass and you can't use nuts, there's no space at all. So what I did was first of all I drilled the holes with a tapping size drill for 6BA, then I threaded the holes with a 6BA tap and here I'm fitting some 6BA countersunk bolts. The problem is that the countersunk head of a 6BA bolt is bigger than the countersunk head of an 8BA bolt. So I very carefully, and I will repeat that, I very carefully used a countersink and countersunk the holes to accept these bolts. And then I repeated the process on the other side. This is something that I should have attended to earlier on in the rebuild, because countersinking the plate work like this with a large handheld drill is dicing with death. But I don't get much excitement in my life these days, and I do like to occasionally live life on the edge. And now sit back and relax because it's taking model engineering to the next level at the Steam Workshop. This is a 7 and a quarter inch gauge tender that John's been working on. And I want to show you this. This is some of John's work as well. Can you see the little swirly bits where it looks like it's been welded? Well, this is not welding. This part was fabricated and silver soldered. But because John's eye for detail is exceptional, he took the time to make this part look like it had been welded just like it is on the full size tender. And this is another example of accurate attention to detail. If you look at these marks on the footsteps, they're not round, they're square. John made a special tool to punch these out on the brass. The other week, another traction engine arrived at the steam workshop and this is colossal. It's a ploughing engine. It has a ploughing drum in between the wheels 
and it really is big. I helped Simon get it out of the back of the trailer, and I wouldn't like it to fall on me. On the bench, right next to the one that I normally work on, is this. Look at this, this is beaten out of copper. And it still looks good, even though it's sustained some damage over the years. And Dave, who works at the steam workshop full time, has been busy removing the paint, and he said it was a really difficult job. The paint's been on there for a long time, and it's very well baked on. This arrived in the post the other day. It's the most bizarre gadget I've ever seen. It's made from carbon fibre, and it's solar powered. So you get it out of the toolbox, and there's no display. Then you shine a light on it, and the display lights up. It's solar powered. This was kindly sent to me by a viewer, and I really do appreciate this. I'm using it at the Steam Workshop, so it's going to live in my Steam Workshop portable toolbox. Right, that's enough fun and frivolity now. I have to make one of these. This is the original and very rusty handrail that I removed from the locomotive when I first stripped it down. It's made of mild steel and it's very rusty. I'm going to make a replacement using a piece of stainless steel. And what I'm doing at the moment is using my newly received calipers to check the diameter of this piece of stainless steel. And yes, it's the right diameter. The original rusty piece of metal had some nicely turned brass pieces at the end. So I'm removing these so I can fit them to the part that I'm going to make. That's the first one removed. These will polish up nicely. And here I'm removing the other one from the other side. I've said many times in these video tutorials that when you're silver soldering, always put the nut on the pipe first. And the same thing applies to this job. This is not going to be silver soldered, of course, but you need to put the handrail stanchion in place to start with. Only the centre one, the two outer ones, can be slid onto the part when it's completed. You will notice that I'm using a round piece of wood. This is not quite the right diameter, but it gives me some idea of how to get the correct curvature. I'm sure it's possible to make a jig to do this, etc, 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 but I just do it by hand. It's trial and error, and if you mess up, you have to start again, so try not to mess up. I'm using the original part as a pattern. Here is a top tip. This is a very coarse wood screw, and the threaded part of this wood screw acts as a very useful guide to help me bend the very tight radiuses on the outer part of the component. Try it yourself and you'll find it a lot easier to bend with a wood screw to guide the bend. The pieces of brass that are currently mounted in the vice jaws are to stop the vice jaws from marking the stainless steel. The only way I could get the original handrail stanchions out of this smoke box was to snap them off. So now, and I forgot to do this once again, I'm just drilling them out and re-threading the holes. These are 8BA. So why do things like this happen? Well, I only work at the steam workshop one day a week. But in fact, as of next week, I'm going to be doing two days a week. The problem with being there just one day per week is that things go wrong. There's an occasional lapse in continuity. When I was dismantling this engine, I got it to a certain stage where things like this needed doing, and when I came back the following week, the engine had been painted by someone at the steam workshop. But it's not a major issue drilling these holes in a painted surface, you just have to be more careful. The next episode in the series shows the completion of the rebuild, and it's about getting it ready for the steam test. But that's it for now, thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.